I'm Chelsea Amber from Christian Guitar Girls, an encouraging community for female guitar players and bass players who love Jesus. And you may have heard that we are starting to do interviews on the YouTube channel and in podcast form. And I'm really excited for you to hear the interviews that are coming up. I hope you'll find them insightful and encouraging for your own journey, your own faith and ministry. And if you happen to know anyone who you think would be a good fit for this podcast, then definitely let me know. You can reach out to info at christianguitargirls.com to either introduce yourself or to tell me about uh, about someone else who you'd love to see an, uh, see an interview with. And also, if you happen to be a female guitar player or bass player who would like to join our community, then you can check out the link in the description for our Facebook group. Now, today we have my friend Lisa Waits. Now, sorry, Reverend Dr. Lisa Waits. She's with us and Man, she's got a lot of credentials, so I'm just going to read some of them. She's a Christian recording artist, a guitar player, a singer, a songwriter of contemporary hymns, an ordained minister. She's founded the um, she's founded Servant Song Music and Ministry. She just released a single earlier this year called Through All of Our Days. We'll get to that, and you'll hear all about that. And she has quite a robust ministry. And looking through the materials about her, I came up with so many questions, way more than we have time to discuss. So I just want to encourage you that if you are enjoying this this interview, definitely check out her Facebook group, her YouTube. I'll be leaving links in the description, Reverb Nation. And so, Lisa, welcome. Welcome to the thank podcast. <laughs> thank you so much, Chelsea. I'm delighted to be here. Awesome. And now we actually met through my dad, which is fun, because you guys were both at the Atlantic School of Theology as students. Yep, that's right, out in Halifax. Mm -hmm. And now we're both living on the West Coast of Canada. So we met on the East Coast. Now we're on the West Coast. Yep. So that's great. Now, first of all, I love to pretend that we are at a table at a coffee shop, you know, so yeah. we're kind of doing that virtually. So what are you drinking today? I have a lovely maple latte that I made myself and I've got in my beautiful farmer's market mug that I bought in Medicine Hat, Alberta. <laughs> nice. I love those yep. types of artisan mugs. They're beautiful. Yeah. So I'm just going to pretend that we're right across the table from each other today. And what have you got in your mug or glass? I have, I have green tea. So nothing, nothing too fancy. Uh, Very nice. Yeah, I love green tea. So I feel like a lot of these episodes are going to have me drinking that. It's a, one of my go-tos. I drink it every day. That's but awesome. that maple latte sounds like a dream. Yes. Yeah. So. Very nice for a March springy day. A little bit mm -hmm. of maple syrup. Yeah. Very Canadian. <laughs> yes. Very Canadian. I love it. So we're going to dive in, and I would love to know a little bit about your guitar journey. We're Christian guitar girls. You do play guitar, and you said that you were self-taught. So can you tell me a little bit about that learning journey? Yes. Actually, it was necessity was the mother of invention for me with guitar. So I had mm -hmm. learned a few chords in high school. I went to a performing arts high school called Walkerville School of the Performing Arts in Windsor, Ontario. And mm -hmm. we had all picked up a little bit of a bunch of different instruments there. But I knew like four chords, not really enough to do much. And I certainly wasn't writing for guitar. But hmm. fast forward a decade, I was living in the Muskoka area of Ontario, and I got hired by a group of Anglicans. Mm -hmm. um, there was a minister at the North Muskoka Pioneer Parish, and they had six Anglican churches, and they hired me to do a contemporary music service for them once a month, but mm -hmm. at all six churches every month. Wow. Oh, my and goodness. And so the, the priest took me around to all these different Pioneer churches, and it turned out two of them had no hydro. Like, they meant Pioneer Parish. They were... Wow you know, those old wooden churches. And there were still lots mm -hmm. of tourists and people that wanted to come come in to worship, especially during the summer. But the only instrument in those buildings were like antique pump organs. And wow. I don't know <laughs> if your listeners know about those instruments, but you have to play the foot pedals like um, bellows, like a pump to make sound come out. And it's like really reedy. And like, it, mm. it seems like it belongs in an 18th century like pioneer movie because that's the time frame it belonged in and I was wow. like there's no way I am going to be able to make this pump organ work to mm -hmm. lead worship and the people are not going to sing a cappella. what am I going to do so I was mm -hmm. like well I'm going to get out that old acoustic guitar and I'm going to figure out how to play some hymns and I spent mm -hmm. that entire summer 
every Sunday before I had to lead worship or Wednesday night, um, I would, you know, practice a few more songs, a few more chords to be able to wow. play a few more hymns. And it just grew from there. And then I discovered I really like acoustic guitar. And now I write probably one in every five songs or so. I'll reach for the guitar first uh, rather great. than the piano, which had always been my primary instrument. Mm. Did it feel like a, a steep learning curve? Because you said you you started with these four chords and now all of a sudden, I think you said six churches. Yeah. Oh, yeah. my goodness. <laughs> oh, how did it that feel? Like, it definitely <laughs> felt like a fake it till you make it and the show must go on kind of moment. Like yeah. I definitely worked hard that summer to learn some basic skills. And I don't I mean, I would never recommend that to my students, but mm. there is a certain amount of like that pressure can mm. produce good work. And um, I certainly learned a lot and have continued learning and growing in, in my own technique. So I like I'm not formally trained in guitar. I've just picked it up along the way. But I've, I've gone from strumming to finger picking to being able to do more intricate patterns and, and really enjoying the sound of it. There's just nothing like it with um, Christmas mm. Carol or an intimate hymn in the middle of a worship set or mm -hmm. it's just it's it's a really versatile instrument and it's a lot easier to take with you to your cabin or on holidays mm -hmm. than your piano <laughs> yeah absolutely much more portable oh, okay so and uh, you know you had mentioned christmas you know and hymns and christmas carols those are actually quite difficult to play on the guitar compared to what we know of for contemporary worship let's say you know a, a chris tomlin tune that probably has maybe four chords in it um, right. And they're written that way on purpose, whereas hymns, they yes. have all these chords. So, oh, yeah. my gosh. I love How the color that? of it, though. Like yeah. just being able to even to be able to hammer on and off or to move up a half step and back again, like just to mm -hmm. to figure out those those finger picking styles. It's it just gives a beautiful color that I don't I don't know anything else that that matches that really. Maybe mm -hmm. maybe adding violin to a couple of carols, but uh, guitar is mm -hmm. just so beautiful for that. Yeah. So and I write a Christmas that? carol every every year. That's something I've done now for, oh, 30 years. Uh, yeah, 30 years at least. Um, That's and so, so cool. yeah, guitar is just a really fun instrument to write on for carols. Hmm. And are these packaged as uh, as albums or are they released as singles? You're, I guess they'd be initially released as singles. Yeah, there, it's it's really been whatever congregation I'm serving or wherever I'm traveling for that particular year. So I mm. write a fresh one sort of for my own sake because my theology changes over time and it's it's just an interesting exercise. I'm always writing something. So for Advent, I make sure Advent or Christmas, I've got something fresh for the church to sing um, because there are that's that's the challenge of having worked in music for a long time people might love an early hymn or early mm. album, but then they're like, well, what have you, what do you, what do you have new for Christmas? Yeah. Like, oh, you know, our choir needs something else from you. What have you got? So mm -hmm. there's, there's that unrelenting pressure of wanting to put out good quality hymns mm -hmm. for churches and choirs to sing uh, and for worship leaders to use. But, you know, the, the hymn that you wrote in 1996 that they love, they may not want to sing again in 2022. So mm -hmm. there's the, the constant creative impulse to write and then mm. uh, to make sure it gets into people's hands. Yeah, well, I commend you for rising to the challenge because that is something that I think a lot of artists feel uh, or even people who are just st stepping into the music industry is like, oh, my goodness, I need to I need to create and create and create. And, you know, <clears throat> in the age of Spotify, the pressure to have to constantly be putting out music. But you're actually rising to the yeah. challenge. You're doing much better than I am at that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's great. I, I mean, I you. certainly have felt that pressure, Chelsea, but I also think, you know, we don't want to be slaves to putting out product just for the sake of putting it out. So mm -hmm. yeah. um, when I'm coaching people, I will always talk about, you know, you need that Holy Spirit spark as a Christian composer. If, if you don't mm -hmm. feel like the spirit is telling you to say something or if God isn't giving you the words in the music, then don't be afraid to, to lay fallow. I mean, I've had mm -hmm. entire years where I've written nothing. And actually, my my fourth album, When I Fall, came came out of a year of significant illness where I where I literally wrote nothing. And then, you know, 10 songs came spilling out in about 12 weeks time um, and formed that that whole album. So wow. um, there are those times where we need to be fallow, sort of our winter season where we're, we're digging mm. our roots deep down into the word and into prayer and into Christ's mm. presence. You can't 
constantly be giving out unless you are also being filled, right? That's Absolutely. just the spiritual principle that um, it's just a law. It's it's God's law. It's a, na- it's a natural law. It's, it's just something that we ignore at our peril. So mm-hmm. I think it's a both and, you know, that mm-hmm. we, we want to be producing, but we, we want to do it in a godly way that doesn't leave us exhausted or burnt out. Yeah. And I think there's a, a bit of a heart check in that too, because um, if we, if we can't say if, now I'm not saying this is, will always be the case, but sometimes if, if we can't say no to something, if we can't put it down for a season, you know, have a, a Sabbath, so to speak, for a certain period of time, then we have to ask ourselves, um, why, why, uh, why can't I put this down? Am I making it an idol? Am I yeah. getting my, my identity from it? You know, it's just a good heart check and that it may not be those things, uh, but it's always just good to ask yourself. I know I've had to ask myself that question too. Am I, am I deriving my my identity from from this, you know, this activity? Um, yes. So, yeah. Um, you had mentioned that you had gone through a season of illness, and I know that you had have faced a number of obstacles throughout your journey because you've been doing music, I believe, since the the nineties. Was it ninety eight yes. when you yeah. started it, your? It's been a whole millennium. <laughs> And it, back then, I think it would have been MySpace. Um, I started on MySpace back when you know, yep. back when I had launched. And so you've seen you've seen changes in the industry. You've also experienced the industry as a woman. I believe you have Métis heritage. You said, yep, that's correct. Um, and then um, you had mentioned that you have a, a disability or are differently abled. I'm not sure. I am yep. so sorry. I'm not sure what the current politically correct term is <laughs> for that right well, now. But me either. But but, you know, the United Church of Canada says that I'm on long term disability leave. So I'm quite comfortable with with, you know, being described as living with medical disability. That's that's an accurate term mm-hmm. for me. OK, uh, there's certainly been challenges along the way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it and you had mentioned uh, just how that getting through that had helped you. God, God poured into you and helped you kind of overcome those times would you be able to talk a little bit about how you've been able to overcome some of the obstacles that you've faced along the way i think the the core foundational thing that has kept me going when when times were hard when when folks were against me when there were gatekeepers that didn't want a female voice or didn't want a christian female voice i remember Mm. my first album the executive producer and i had this sustained conflict over what i would or wouldn't wear for the photo shoot for the cover Mm. album and, mm. and I mean, this was not a Christian company. I've, I've worked with Christian labels and non-Christian labels over the years, but this was my first encounter with a, with a commercial record label. And I remember just, just being immovable. I just wasn't willing to be a sex symbol. I wasn't willing mm. to be commodified. And, and, you yeah. know, he, he, the long and short of it was, you know, you're going to fail at this. This will not be a success because only sex sells. And, and we parted mm. ways over that. I mean, mm. And the album did just fine. And I think it was an important lesson for me early on, although it was very painful at the time, that I wasn't going to let the gatekeepers or the the way the music industry felt like it had organized itself stand in the way of the call of God. Mm-hmm. And so, like, I know I am called as a songwriter and as a worship leader and as a preacher, yeah. and I'm just not going to let anybody get in the way of that. Yes. And so in the beginning, you know, it was me and my case of CDs and and my husband, you know, carrying the equipment and going from church to church and town to town and um, just building the ministry as best I knew how. And, and, you know, in time, it went from being in Ontario to being across the country and then into the US and then touring in other places in Asia and Europe and across the UK and God mm-hmm. just kept opening doors and and, and so, Carnegie Hall I need to throw that one in there yeah um, mind-boggling that you were able Keith to do and that Kristen Getty uh, yeah. had had a group of us sing with them at, at Carnegie Hall and it was amazing like oh I'm just hanging out with Phil Kagey and Keith and Kristen like it, it was an amazing moment my brain but there's is been a lot of yeah yeah like Carnegie Hall like the mm. acoustics are amazing it's just it, even just hanging out in the green room, it's like, am I really here? Like somebody pinched wow. me. Uh, there've been uh, some really amazing moments, but but you know, God moments. Like mm. the, the third album, To Sing the Sacred, was never meant to be released. It was a sacramental wow. song cycle that I wrote for my thesis at Atlantic School of Theology. 
only my prof didn't know how to read music and I didn't know that at the time. So I had written out the scores and I was just gonna submit it with the paper and that was gonna be my thesis project. And he's like, well, I don't know what to do with this. I don't read music. Oh. And so I was like, okay, I'll just make a quick scratch recording in St. Columba Chapel, which is right there on the grounds of the, of the campus of AST called the first music person I saw in the, in the listing. I mean, literal yellow pages in those days. Mm. And it happened to be Scott Ferguson, which was amazing. Mm. Asked him if he could bring his equipment to the chapel. We did the whole album through live, piano and voice at the same time. I just played through all 10 tracks, one after another, straight through. That was it. Mm. He, he was not a Christian and stood up at the end and was like literally in a posture of worship saying that he had goosebumps and this had oh. to be put out into the world. It couldn't just oh. live in my professor's hands. Oh, and so, man, we, I got chills just listening yeah, to that. It was amazing. Just, it was just amazing. And and that was such a God thing. It was never meant to be out in the world. And then, you know, this, this evangelical church uh, in Alberta gave me a patronage so that I could send it out to people in developing nations who needed it. And it started wow. to be requested for like orphanages and maternity wow. wards and prisons and schools and like all these places. And I mean, that album was released in 2011. It was my first GMA nomination it opened up so many doors for me. And now, you know, 11 years later, I still get letters probably once a week from people saying, I gave birth to my baby listening to that album. You helped me so much. Thank you. Or, wow. you know, my sister died to that album and it was so gracious. Thank you so much. Mm. Like it was a God project. And wow. so when you have those signposts from God, um, just encouraging and equipping you for the ministry there's not really a lot of room for doubt like mm -hmm. you just keep walking through the doors that god opens yeah um, oh man that's a great encouraging word i as you were talking i was thinking about that song oh i forget the band but this song it goes little is much when god's in it yeah um, oh it's a canadian band that they've disbanded mark martell uh Okay. Well, anyway, I'm sure someone can re uh, comment and let me know because it's ah, uh, it bugs me that I can't. But anyway, um, I love that that the little as much when God is in it, and maybe it felt, you know, like oh, I just I'm I'm only just gonna do this for a thesis, which I guess is not a small thing. But you didn't intend to, you know, go and put all of this out into the world, and yeah. God just multiplied it, and I, yeah. I just find that incredible when you we yeah. put what we have into God's hands. To and see what and he does with it. It's about God's glory and God's faithfulness. It's it's mm -hmm. a witness to God, not to not to me as a songwriter, not to you know the church that equipped me. But all of those parts had to happen for it to go out into all those mm -hmm. different countries. And so I I really one of my favorite passages of all of Scripture is is the passage in First Corinthians twelve about us being the body together, mm -hmm. and how you know the eye can't say you don't need the foot, and the foot can't say you don't need the hand, and the parts that we think are you know shameful we need to treat with extra honor and dignity and how we all belong and work together and i've just seen that over and over in my ministry mm -hmm. that if you know one person didn't recommend me to come and speak or preach i wouldn't have met the next person that opened three more doors or mm. i couldn't have encouraged the person who really needed it at that moment like yeah. and over 30 years of ministry you get to hear some of those stories over time, you know, of mm -hmm. someone who is so discouraged and depressed, they were thinking about ending their life and, and somehow God used your music or your word of encouragement to turn things around for them or yeah. to get them to reach out and have help. Like there's, there are just countless stories. And mm -hmm. when I'm discouraged, I actually, I, I have what I call a happy file. It's an old mm -hmm. paper file in my filing cabinet and it's full of like those notes and cards and like little encouragements because mm -hmm. I'm sure you know as an artist, I mean, we, we get lots more no's than we get yeses in the industry, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so something that helps me keep focused and encouraged is, is reading those notes from real live Christian people who have mm -hmm. benefited from my ministry and who just give that word of encouragement. Yeah. Because lots of us as artists, we're working on our own a lot of the time. And, yep. and particularly, I think, as women, we can sort of feel marginalized or or lonely or sort of off on our own. Mm -hmm. um, at least that's what it sounds like when we get together from GMA, you know, that we really have that desire to to encourage and support one another because yep. we are alone so much. Alone at the piano or alone with the guitar in our hands, 
you know, mm-hmm. writing or leading or wondering if we're doing what God is calling us to do or, yeah. um, you know, all that insidious sort of secular, am I good enough? Am I talented enough? Can I make it? Mm-hmm. And if my career, my vocation can can teach anything, it's that you, you really don't have to make it. You can take all of that pressure off of yourself. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's... Mm-hmm. It, there is, I don't know anybody in the industry that would say, oh, Lisa Waits would be a good commercial bet. Like I don't, my music doesn't fit in any commercial genre. It's not top 40. It's not radio friendly. It's, it's contemporary oh, it's, hymns for the, hymns, for yeah. the worship of the church. Right. Mm-hmm. And yet I've been able to, to never be without work along the way mm-hmm. all these years. And, and God has opened some amazing ecumenical doors that I wouldn't have expected. Yeah, you know, mainline but, and evangelical, Catholic and Protestant, you know, sort mm-hmm. of like Anglican to to Wesleyan and everything in between. Man, God is so faithful. I love hearing His faithfulness in your journey, and I feel like all throughout you've you've peppered your story with all these encouraging words and these pieces of pieces of advice for for our listeners. You know, um, like pulling out those pieces of paper of of you know encouraging words from real people when you feel like, oh, you know, I got this pressure. I have to make it. I have to be a commercial success. I have to, you know, yeah. um, and it's, it's not about us. It's about God. That's you right. Know? Yeah. yeah absolutely. So, oh, oh, I love that. Um, now, before we wrap up, I did want to ask you about your latest song. It's called Through All of Our Days. It is a contemporary hymn. And uh, can you talk a little bit about this song, the inspiration behind it? Oh, you know what? Okay, before we do that, we had mentioned GMA. <laughs> We're going to put a pin in that question for a second. Okay. I did want to clarify because um, we had mentioned GMA. For people who don't know what that is, that is called the Gospel Music Association of Canada. And then it's Gospel Music Association in the States. Um, they're the, so GMA in the the states they're the ones that award the dove awards every year and then in canada we have the covenant awards which is the equivalent of the dove awards in the states so i just wanted to give that background information to anybody who's listening and they hear gma they're like what the heck is gma it's not good morning america yeah. it's <laughs> gospel music association <laughs> of canada uh, yeah but anyway, so great I thought, point. Yeah, so I thought, oh, I just want to mention that because we do have uh, we do have people who are going to be tuning into this who are not from Canada, and so right. I just want to make sure that um, that we that we uh, explain that. So getting back to your your new single, through all of our days, I would love to hear a little bit more about what inspired it and and the the process of of putting that song out into the world. So actually what inspired it was um, the United Church of Canada is putting out a a new hymnal for their 100th anniversary. And they had put out a call asking for specific categories of songs. So songs, Mm. hymns that we don't have great representation of in our existing hymnals, Voices United and More Voices. Mm. And so um, a hymn for Ash Wednesday was on the list. And I was Mm. like, oh, that's really interesting. I've never written a hymn for Ash Wednesday. And so I I started reading a little bit theologically about the the traditions of Ash Wednesday and looking over the liturgies of the church over Mm. the last several hundred years and quickly came up with a melody and and the lyrics just flowed with it. And it it turned out it is a little bit about Ash Wednesday, but it it also has Lenten themes. And the the overarching theme is about how God's love attends us, surrounds us, Mm. enfolds us from beginning to end. Mm. That, you know, the chorus talks about that we will, we will laugh, we will cry, we will dance, we will sing that from beginning to end through all of our days, God enfolds us in his love and care. Mm. And so um, I released it on March 2nd to coincide with Ash Wednesday. And Mm. the first week it was out there, I started to get requests from clergy saying, could I use this for a funeral? I think this would be beautiful. Or Mm. could I use this for a baptism? Um, We, we, you know, there are images in the video that show, you know, babies and adults being baptized. And, um, Mm. and so it was like, you know, anytime there's a milestone in life, it really fits, whether that's a baptism or a, faith confirmation or a covenanting service for a pastor who's about to get ordained or called to a congregation, um, mm-hmm. you know, for, for wedding anniversaries, for um, points of life, hospice care, all the way along in, in our human milestones. And so it's been really interesting. I mean, it hasn't even been out a month yet. So by the time mm-hmm. your listeners hear it, it'll maybe have found its footing out in the world. But 
Mm -hmm. um, one of the things about YouTube videos is you can quite easily translate it. And I've had requests now for 12 different languages. So it's, it's been out in, in a wow. number of different countries um, wow. with the subtitles so that uh, congregations can sing along. That's amazing. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And where can people find you and find this song online? So the if you want to watch the video, it's up on YouTube. To mm -hmm. listen to the audio track, it's out on Spotify, YouTube, iTunes, and uh, Reverb Nation. You mm -hmm. can download it any of those places. Oh, and Deezer, I think, is also carrying it. Okay. Um, and then if you're a sheet music person, if you want to play guitar to the hymn, mm -hmm. then you can look for it on sheetmusicplus.com. And there are two versions of the hymn there. There's the piano, vocal, guitar version, and mm -hmm. then there's an SATB um, choral version. So soprano, alto, tenor, bass, choral version. So, And that's been another huge delight just to hear how it sounds because you imagine mm. it in your head as the composer, but then to hear it in all the different voices is just such a delight. So um, I'm happy to hear both versions. If you, if you download and play it somewhere, please send me a recording. I love to hear people singing the music. Okay, excellent. So we will leave some links in the description so people can access the song and, and your ministry. I encourage everyone to check it out. I have felt so encouraged and just so excited about the faithfulness of God in taking yeah. what we have to offer and multiplying it. So thank you so much for that encouragement with this delightful conversation. And to uh, all of our listeners here, if you enjoyed this chat, there are many more to come. So make sure you subscribe either on YouTube or on your favorite podcast app. And uh, you can check out the episode description for links to connect with Lisa and also to connect with the Christian Guitar Girls Facebook group. So uh, that's it for today. I'll catch you in the next episode. And until then, happy strumming. Mm -hmm.